All right, we are in Exodus chapter 25. We are looking at a snapshot of heaven. Some people wonder, why do we study the Old Testament? Well, don't you want to know what heaven's like? Because here, especially in this section, we're going to read uh, details about what our heavenly home is going to be like. Now, you know the difference between a tourist and a tour guide, right? A tour guide is able to show people the sights, show the interesting things, the different nuances of any place. Well, then there are the tourists. And they got their sandals with their black socks and their shorts and their big camera and they're walking around. I can't believe this, Martha, would you look here? (laughs) I don't want to be a tourist when I get to heaven. I'd rather be a tour guide. And the Lord gives to us here in Exodus that which is most detailed in all of scriptures when when we're talking about anything the most detail the most biblical real estate is given to the tabernacle think about that creation i mean in two chapters it's it's done and over god created the heavens and the earth in six days and took them only two chapters but we're dealing with a tabernacle which covers the bulk of exodus and and then also into uh, numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and and so there's so much here about the tabernacle because it's really a snapshot of heaven. It's a static picture of a heavenly living reality. Now, back in chapter 24, if you remember from our previous study, once again, God called Moses back up onto Mount Sinai to meet with him. Remember, Israel was encamped at Mount Sinai for almost one year, 11 months and five days to be exact. During that time, the Lord called Moses to ascend the mountain on several occasions. How old was Moses? How old was he? He was 80 years old. He's going up and down the mountain over and over again. That dude was in shape, man. But here Moses now, called up by God, is also told to bring with him up to a certain point his older brother Aaron, whom God later on made the high priest, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders, and also Moses' assistant, Joshua. They were called to ascend the mountain to worship the Lord, but only so far, just barely come up to the mountain. At that point, God said, okay, that's as far as you can come. And the reason being is, I think, is that God was declaring that he's holy, and he must be regarded as holy, and only those who are holy can come into his presence. Only those who are holy. I didn't say only those who are good. Because there's none good. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Holy. Now, holy is a practical thing, but it's also a positional thing. Practically speaking, I think we all kind of have a little ways to go in our lives to become really, really holy, separate from the world. Where we would look at our lives and we say, we have nothing in our lives that promotes the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes of the pride of life. That's what holiness is. It, is. it is being as close to Jesus as we possibly can be. Being like him in our thoughts and our words and our actions and what we watch, what we listen to. And so how many of us would be bold enough to say, oh yes, I live a practically holy life just as if Jesus were here living it himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently uh, it's good that we have positional holiness. That because of your faith in Jesus, God sees you as righteous and holy. God has separated you unto himself, and so now you can come into his presence, unlike uh, Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders and Joshua even. Under the old covenant, you could worship God, but only from afar. Even the high priest could come into the Holy of Holies only once a year. And you better make sure that he had a blood sacrifice for himself and for the people. And if he failed in some way, God swore that he would kill him. There's a tradition that when the high priest would get ready on Yom Kippur, bringing in that bowl of blood to offer up there on the uh, mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, that he would have bells on the hem of his robe and a rope tied to his foot. And as long as the people outside heard the bells jingling, they knew things were fine. But all of a sudden, if they stopped instantly, a guy must have been in sin. Let's drag him out. God killed him. 
And that was a very real threat that they had. But under the new covenant, we all are invited to come near. And before we get into our study here in Exodus 25, if you want to quickly t- uh, turn to Hebrews 4 and verses 14 through 16, we read, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, and it's Jesus, the Son of God. Let us therefore hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Aren't you glad that we don't worship a God who is totally detached from us and our needs and our feelings? But Jesus was here. He took on human flesh. Still fully God, but yet also fully man. Going through the same things we go through. Tempted in all points as we are, as the Bible says, yet without sin. In fact, it says he cannot, we have this high priest uh, who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, and here's the good news for us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. And so that's the promise that we have now because of what Jesus had done. Beforehand, you could worship God, but it was from afar off because you're just not holy enough. And so Moses was told with your assistant Joshua and Aaron and all, come up to the mountain. And then back in Exodus 24 and verse 14, Moses said to the 70 elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. And if any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. So I'm leaving these guys in charge. I'm sure they'll do a fabulous, wonderful job. (laughs) Well, if you know anything about the rest of the story, this wasn't a good thing. It was like having a weasel guard the hen house. It really worked out bad, the golden calf and all that. We'll get to that some other day. So Moses goes up in the mountain cloud, Uh, covered the mountain. Verse 16, the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it six days. Seventh day, he, the Lord, called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Very foreboding because the law was never intended to make anyone righteous, but it was intended to reveal that we are sinners and in need of a Savior. So if you ask somebody, are you going to heaven? They say, oh yeah, I am. You ask them why. And if they say, I keep the Ten Commandments, you know, try to keep yourself from laughing in their face. But the truth of the matter is nobody, we all blow it at commandment number one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And you tell the person, look, honestly, you've had other passions in your life that, that were greater than God. You've deferred to other people, even your own desires, in, in many instances. You've worshipped other. Maybe you don't have little images and icons and statutes, but certainly you have held other things as more important than God in your heart. You've lived as if God doesn't even exist. You've had strange gods, therefore you've broken the Ten Commandments. And that's what the law is intended to do. It's not a cleansing agent, it's a mirror. And when you look at the mirror, the mirror doesn't clean you. It shows, though, that you need cleaning, right? And that's what the law was intended to do, to show us that we need the one who cleanses us from all sin, who is, of course, Jesus. So verse 24, or excuse me, I mean verse 18, Moses went into the midst of the cloud, went up into the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. During that time, he neither ate nor drank. It was an absolute miraculous fast. And he would do it a couple of times. Miraculous fast. Don't go on a 40-day fast of no food or liquids unless you're absolutely sure God calls you to it. Because that 40-day fast will turn into about a few days and then you'll be with the Lord. You need liquids. Water, at least. But Moses had this miraculous fast. Now, He goes up on the mountaintop, and guess what the first thing was that God told Moses to tell the people? The first commandments, or the first, in fact, it's not even a commandment. He goes up this time. Now, he had already been up and down a few times and declaring the law of God, and the people were like, yeah, we've heard the voice of God. We don't want to hear it again. You be the go-between, but whatever God says, we'll do. So Moses goes up this, this next time, And the first thing he was to tell the people is found here in verses 1 through 9, which is support the sanctuary. Support 
the sanctuary. I know some of you are visiting and you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, he's going after my pocketbook, isn't he? And already you're kind of holding on to your wallets. Well, there you go. Good job. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Now, notice it's not compulsory. There were other offerings that were compulsory. The tithe, you had to do it under the old covenant. 10% off the top. And you know the joke is, some people ask, is that your gross or your net? And the answer to that is, do you want gross blessings or net blessings? But under the law, it was 10%. But for the tabernacle itself, there was no demand, no requirement, no command of God. Whoever, from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Moses wasn't to ask, or he was simply to ask. He wasn't to beg or compel. Now, there's nothing wrong for a minister to ask God's people to give to the work of the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But it is wrong for the minister to manipulate people, to employ strong arm tactics, or the promise of greater riches should you give to the Lord now. And I've heard, I'm sure you've heard them too. Those guys on religious television, the promoting the so-called hundredfold blessing. That whatever you give God, God is obligated to give you back a hundredfold. You give God a dollar, he owes you a hundred. You give God 10 bucks, he owes you a thousand. Am I math right? Okay. You, go, you give him a hundred, he owes you, you can figure it out. A lot of zeros after that. And so now they're, they're preying upon people, upon their ignorance of the scripture, because the Bible never said, if you give God a dollar, he owes you a hundred. It's just wrenching scriptures out of context. And so a minister, yes, please give to the work of the Lord, to the building and to the, the, the utilities and the salaries and, and all the stuff that goes on here, but never to compel or twist arms because in the New Testament, God's people should never feel compelled to give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. If you don't give, the ministry's going to fold. Okay, if God's not blessing, then it should fold. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And you, I'm sure you know that The word cheerful there can also be translated hilarious. In other words, it should strike us as really funny that the God of the universe who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, who has saved us from eternal destruction, says, you know what? If you want, you can be part of building God's kingdom on earth with some money. And really, our money comes from God anyway, right? We're just giving back to him a portion of what he has so abundantly blessed us with. So if you feel that you're pressure to give, man, keep it. Because if you give under pressure, you don't receive a heavenly reward. But if you give as they did back in Moses' day from a willing heart or a hilarious giver, you will receive a heavenly reward. And, and here's the one motivation, really, that I would, would give is give to the Lord today and he will bless you by and by. It may be heaven. But if you think about it, wouldn't you rather have eternal reward than just a temporary kickback on this side? Because you get something on this side and, oh, that's great. Praise the Lord. Look at this. And then you spend it. You know, on on wonderful things like tires or other auto repair. And so God promises we can never outgive them, but really... I think that most of our giving is going to be rewarded in heaven, which would be better anyway. Now notice uh, in verse 3 what they were to give. So everybody who wants to give, go ahead and give. Verse 3, and this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold. Now remember, these people were former slaves to the Egyptians. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread fine linen, and goat's hair. Goat's hair. 
You know, it, it is interesting that once they completed the tabernacle, when you're in the Holy of Holies, it was unbelievably spectacular. The gold and the, the, the tapestries and all, and the, 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 the presence, the, the glow of God, the chabod, the weightiness, the shekinah, the glory of God. Just mind-boggling how awesome it was on the inner, innermost part. But as you proceeded out, eventually you came to the actual covering of the tabernacle, and they were, they were goat's hair woven like canvas things, black sheets, blankets basically, covering the whole thing. It was ugly from the outside. But the more you went in toward the inside, the more beautiful it became. The tabernacle is all about Jesus. It's not about the church per se, not about Protestantism or Catholicism or the priesthood or the pastorate. It's all about Jesus. In Isaiah, we read that when, if we were to see him, he had no comeliness, no beauty that we would desire of him. In other words, if you were to see Jesus in the flesh, he wouldn't be this hunk of a guy, this Fabio-looking, you know, beefcake sort of dude. He would have been a very average-looking Jewish man, maybe with a larger nose, a monobrow. So it was on the outside, though, that made him eternally valuable. It's the inside. The more he got to his heart, the more glory is revealed. Absolute, stunning beauty, the heart of Jesus and his grace and his mercy toward you and me. So as they're collecting these materials, they're going to be making the tabernacle. But keep in mind, it's all about Jesus. Remember when, when Judas brought the soldiers to arrest Jesus? Remember the signal that he gave? So that the soldiers would know the right guy to apprehend? What did he say? One who I kiss. He didn't say the real tall guy, the real stud muffin, you know, the long flow. No, he just said he had to, he had to point him out. Jesus was very plain. He didn't glow. You know, you see some of those medieval pictures of some, you know, glowing Frisbee on top of Jesus' head, and, and he's, he's in pure white clothes, and everybody else is dressed in rags. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. And he certainly wasn't Swedish. And he wasn't some paste, he wasn't some pasty faced white guy with blue eyes either. He was very, very Middle Eastern Jewish in his appearance. So goat's hairs. Yeah, that'd be the forming the covering. Ram skins dyed red. You know, of all these things, it speaks of, of Jesus, gold as deity, silver, the atonement that he made, bronze, the judgment that he took upon himself, blue. Heaven, purple, royalty, scarlet, thread. Reminds us of Rahab. And more importantly, reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed. Fine linen, Jesus is our high priest. Goat's hair, he had nothing special about him to look at. And on and on and on. Badger skins, and by the way, that word badger skins is also translated in some of your Bibles as um, porpoise skins or sea cow skins. And here's the, the, the reason why. They really don't know what type of animal this was. But it was a very durable leather. That's what they all agree on. And acacia wood. We're going to see what they did with the acacia wood here. And by the way, acacia trees grow in a very desert climate, very hard wood, resistant to rot, impervious to insects, very in insect resistant as well. It's a hard wood that lasts for a long, long time that cannot be corrupted. What does that speak of? It speaks of, well, it could speak of the cross. Also, it could speak of Jesus' humanity, tempted as we were yet without sin, impervious to sin. Oil for the light, spices, anointing oil for the sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, which the high priest would would wear valuable, costly, precious things. But where did these 
Jewish slaves get this stuff from? From the Egyptians, remember? After the plagues were levied upon Egypt and the Lord said to the Jews, now go ask of all your Egyptian neighbors and whoever for their costly articles. It's back pay, you know, for the 400 years of slavery you endured. But more than that, you're going to be able to use your pay to invest in God's tabernacle, the place of meeting. Yeah, in a sense, it's your pay. You work for it. God did give you the strength to work for it, gave you the job. But even more than that, it's for you and me to invest in God's tabernacle. So costly, precious things. Why did they do this? Verse 8, God says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Later on, the Lord will say, it's the tent of meeting where I will meet with them. Now, God is not, and Solomon later on, when he built the temple, he made it very clear, the Lord is not housed in any building made with hands. The heavens are his throne, the earth is his footstool. So this tent of meeting and later on the temple itself was not a place where God was made comfortable. But it was a place where we could come and meet with God on his terms. And always, 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 the tabernacle and the temple, when you came from the outside coming in, the first thing you had to do was what? Bring a sacrifice. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And without the shedding of blood, there's no way you or I could come into the presence of God. That's why Jesus had to die. To shed his blood for you and me. And notice that it says in verse 9, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so You shall make it. I love this. Moses, you don't have to be super smart and creative. You don't have to come up with the plans on your own. In fact, here they are. Bingo. And he shows them everything. And he expects Moses to make sure that it's built according to that pattern. Don't embellish it. Don't think you know better. Just do it the way I tell you to. By the way, when all was said and done, it was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. That's not very big, is it? This room from side to side, 60 feet in width. I know because we cut these lines and they're two and a half feet by three feet, so you count them up, the 60 feet across. So the tabernacle itself was small. Comparatively speaking. And so Moses would have, might have thought, well, we need to make something bigger. No, you don't. It doesn't have to be impressive as far as size is concerned. And so make it according to the pattern. I think the Lord is trying to, at least that my takeaway is this. I come to God on his terms. I better not embellish upon it. I better not add to or take away from Because God has given the plan. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's his plan. Don't add your good works to it. Don't think you can improve upon it. You can't improve upon Jesus' death and resurrection, gang. Payment in full, more than enough. His grace is sufficient. So God gave these specific instructions to Moses. The blueprint, as we find out from the book of Hebrews, the blueprint of heaven. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, the priests, speaking of them, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he, the Lord, said to Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So that's why it's important to know this tabernacle because it's really a picture, a snapshot of our heavenly home, a living reality up there somewhere. And we get to see a little photo of it, a little picture of it. 
Now, some of you might have seen the, the picture of, of, uh, the, that, of the fish that James or, or John back there or even myself caught, those really nice big bass. You know, you can appreciate that picture only so far. We got to eat them. That's better. Far better. We got to catch them. The other day I went fishing. I took a piece of hot dog, threw it out there on the bottom, hoping for catfish. Rumble for emphasis there. <laughs> and I put it in a rod holder, and I went on, and I was casting for bass, and all of a sudden I see a rod go down. And I'm like, oh, hey, great, I got a catfish. And I went over, and I start reeling it, and it started to fight differently than a catfish, and then it came up to the surface, and it jumped out. It was a huge bass on a hot dog on the bottom. <laughs> Man, the Lord was with me. Because that never happens. And so I got to appreciate reeling that monster in. It weighed like 900 pounds. It was monster fish holding it up in the picture and all. And then I got to fillet it. And then a little olive oil with some Cajun seasoning and garlic salt. Mm -hmm. See, others, they just see the picture. And they can kind of imagine. Well, that's what we're looking at here. It's going to be way better when we get to heaven, gang. We get to taste and see and experience and hear and feel. And then other senses, no doubt, we'll get to, to, to somehow have multidimensional grace of God, multifaceted grace of God that he'll be explaining to us throughout eternity when we get to heaven. But here, here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. Again, I want to be a tour guide, not a tourist. I don't want to be some country bumpkin from the farm. That, well, it's really cool here. I don't get it. Well, if you don't get it, it's because you weren't here in Bible study on Wednesday night going through the tabernacle. Okay, verses 10 through 14, we're going to read about the tabernacle furnishings. Again, not very big room. It was 45 feet by 15 by... 15, and uh, then, the, then it was divided in the middle by a veil separating the back part of it into a square known as the Holy of Holies and the front part a little larger rectangle known as the Holy Place. And there were only four pieces of furniture, three in the Holy Place and one in the Holy of Holies. But man, they all speak about Jesus. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. A cubit estimated to be the distance from a man's elbow to the tip of his middle finger, roughly 18 inches long, a foot and a half. Make an arc of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. So the Ark of the Covenant was roughly three and a half feet long, two feet wide, two feet deep. A rectangular box. It was made of acacia wood from the acacia tree. And as I mentioned before, a virtually indestructible hardwood, impervious to insects and rot. Very beautiful piece of wood when it's stained and, and finished nicely. And since everything about the tabernacle is all about Jesus, the acacia wood, I think, reminds us of his humanity. Impervious to sin and the corruption. But notice in verse 11, so they make this beautiful, beautiful wooden box. Maybe they dovetail joints or whatever, I don't know. But then you shall overlay it with pure gold. Pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it. So now we're dealing with this costly metal, which many believe speaks of deity. Deity. How Jesus, the man, was also from eternity past and eternity future, is also God. And next part of verse 11, you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. A molding or a rim that stuck up a little bit above. So that when the mercy seat was placed on it, it wouldn't slide off. It would be held in place by that rim going all the way around. Which is very, very important Stay tuned for why. Verse 12, you shall cast four rings of gold for it, 
Put them on its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Man, some people complain that some churches waste money on a chandelier, on a grand piano. It's like, man, just read about the tabernacle and you, you won't complain about a church with a chandelier or a grand piano. I don't ever want to have a chandelier. I don't think this building really is nice enough for one. And a grand piano, they take up a lot of real estate, so we'll just stick with the electronic keyboards. But make poles, overlay them with gold. Then you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark. Then the ark may be carried by them. It was never to be hauled on a cart. That was a Gentile way. But they're always to be carried by the priests. Remember David? He had a wonderful idea, but horrible execution. He wanted to bring the ark from kiriath Jerem to Jerusalem to where on the temple mount there, before the temple was built, obviously, they had erected the tabernacle. And so they put it on a cart. And I love what one pastor say, what is a cart? It's a board, a bunch of boards and, and big wheels. A lot of churches think they can bring in the glory of God by their boards and their big wheels. That's a horrible mistake. And so the oxen are pulling. There were two guys who remembers their, their, what their names were? Two guys that were there with the ark. Uzzah and, means with an A, uh, later, Ahio. Uzzah and Ahio. Ahio means friendly. Uzzah means strong. And so you have the friendly guy out front shaking hands. How you doing? Welcome and praise the Lord. And he's, you know, he's the greeter. And, you know, and, and uh, it's been said, if a church doesn't have good greeters, then the church is not going to go well because you never have a second chance to make a first impression. You've got to have Ohio there. woo Welcome. Glad to have you. And then Uzzah, the strong man, the power team. You remember them? Guys who snap baseball bats? That's going to bring the glory. We'll get these, these roided up guys to come in and bench press five million pounds and break baseball bats over their knees, and then people are going to get saved. It'll be awesome. Well, they put the ark on the cart. They're going down the road. The oxen stumbled. Uzzah, strong man, went to put his hand out to steady the ark. And God, like Popeye said, I've had all I could stand and I can't stand no more. And he smote strong man right there on the spot. David said, how can I bring the ark into the tabernacle? And guess where he turned to? The word of God. He read what God had said, and it was to be carried by the priests with its poles. And so, okay, we'll do that. And then they were sacrificing along the way, and it was a glorious, glorious time. And they were able to bring it in. So, these poles, the poles shall be in, verse 15, the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. Because if God wants it to be moved, it needs to be ready to move right now. And you know, I'm reminded that wherever I am in life, Jesus is always with me. Wherever I go. He doesn't say, well, yeah, I got, I got to get ready. I'll catch up with you later. No, he's always on the move. In fact, he's the one who's moving and I need to follow. And you shall put it into the ark, the testimony which I will give to you. So at this point, God had not yet given him the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on them. By the way, they put in two other things into the Ark of the Covenant. Who can tell me what those other two things were? What, uh, sorry? Aaron's rod that budded, a dead stick that came to life, and a jar of manna. How does that all speak about Jesus? You have the Ten Commandments. He kept the law perfectly on our behalf, right? You have the pot of manna. The bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life. And Aaron's dead stick that came back to life. That's easy, isn't it? Jesus rose from the dead. In this wooden box overlaid with gold. And then, verse 17, the lid for the, for the ark, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold because only God can give mercy. The mercy that we need. Mercy seat of pure gold Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. 
So this was the lid that fit on top of the ark. And you shall make two cherubim, angels, a class of angels, of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the ends, two ends of the mercy seat. There are some estimates that that lid of pure gold, if it was a half inch thick, would have been about 300 plus pounds, just the lid. Just the lid. And it's very likely it was an inch or more thick. Heavy, huh? Anyway. Cherubim, angels at each end. Uh, you shall make the cherubim uh, of it of one piece with a mercy seat. The cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So the angels with their outstretched rings are looking down on the mercy seat. That's where the high priest poured the blood. Also, that's the place where God's glory was revealed. But it's called a mercy seat. In fact, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what's called the Septuagint, it's called the propitiation seat. The full, complete payment seat. Now, the angels looking down on the mercy seat. The Holy Spirit through Peter maybe is kind of explaining why. And we read this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. To them it was revealed, speaking of the Old Testament prophets who prophesied about the Messiah and salvation that would be by his grace and mercy. To them it was revealed that, well, not to themselves, but to us, for you and me here. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. See, the angels are blown away at the fact that God has given you and me grace and mercy. Them? Really? Because they see us too. And they know what we're doing and saying. They might not know what we think, but they certainly see us doing and saying things, and yet they are blown away at the mercy that God has given to you and me. And maybe that's what the Lord was trying to indicate as they were looking down on the mercy seat. Verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you, and there I will meet with you and will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Again, mercy seat, the word mercy, uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek, uh, it's the word hilsosmos, which means propitiation, full, complete payment. It's the same word that's used in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's a big $3 word, isn't it? Propitiation. Five syllables, wow. That's a mouthful. But it means full, complete payment, whereby you and I stand before God now justified. Justified, never sinned. Because of what Jesus has done, his payment. And that's what the mercy seat was all about. By the way, remember how the ark had that molding around that made sure that the mercy seat wouldn't slip off? There's a reason for that. While the priests were carrying it, if, if they stumbled, tilted it a little bit, that mercy seat wouldn't fall off because that rim would hold it in place. And to me, I, I love this because, I don't know about you, but I've, I've stumbled. I've sinned before. Since coming to faith in Jesus, there have been at least one or two instances where I've stumbled. But God's mercy has never flown off. It's always been there, still in place, sufficient. We read in Psalm 103, verse 11, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Okay, but what if I do sin? And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, 
the righteous. His mercy is sufficient and his mercy endures forever. And I think that's one of the main reasons why God made sure that that rim was around there to keep the mercy seat in place. But what if somebody were to purposefully take off that lid, that mercy seat, and look into it, something that God said, don't you ever do? What if somebody brazenly, wantonly trespassed and just, you know, maybe get a few, if it weighed a few hundred pounds, get a couple few buddies and they take it off to look inside, what would happen to them? Well, we don't have to guess. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, Israel was in battle with the Philistines and the Philistines beat them and they captured the ark. Somebody thought it'd be a good idea to rally the Israeli troops and bring the ark into the battle. That was dumb. And so the Philistines captured the ark. Now, they didn't look inside of it, but still God wasn't happy with them. He smote them with rats and tumors. I love the old King James version of uh, why, what, how it translates tumors. It's emeralds, which sounds a lot like, yeah, Hemor- yeah, exactly. Hemorrhoids. Yeah. And, and so they figured, well, we can't keep this ark here unless the rats and the hemorrhoids get the best of us. And so <laughs> they decided they would do the Philistine thing and put the ark on a cart and have cows. And, and, and they, their idea was if the cows make a beeline for Israel, then we know that the God of Israel is angry at us. But if the cows meander, then we'll just think, well, we just had an abundance of rats and hemorrhoids. <laughs> and it's just a coincidence Well, those cows made a beeline for Israel, specifically to the town of Beth Shemesh. Now, the Jews of Beth Shemesh, when they saw the cows coming and the ark on it, they were thrilled. They were, oh, praise God that it's come back to us. But then some guys, morons, they said, well, hey, nobody's really gotten to see this. Only the high priest once a year gets to see it. Let's take a peek, shall we? And they opened it up and looked inside, and guess what happened? 50,070 people died in a plague that God sent upon Israel. Think about this. They removed the mercy, and they looked directly at the law. The law kills, the law destroys. And when you don't have the mercy of God between you and the law, you're going to fry. You are going to die forever and ever and ever. Without believing in Jesus, there's no mercy, only judgment. Other than that occasion, the ark, as I mentioned, was only seen once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. While it was in the tabernacle, those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, occasionally the glory cloud was moved and so everybody had to go. The high priest would then go into the Holy of Holies and he would cover the furnishings, including the ark. And then other priests came in and without them ever seeing it, they would go in behind the veil, they would pick up the ark, and they would move on. The veil and the, the, the fabrics and everything that we'll read about in the weeks to come, they were all packed up and they were put, some of them were put on carts, but the, but the furnishings inside the tabernacle were all carried by these poles. It was very rare that anybody ever was in the presence of God. Once a year. Very rare. And only one person. When Jesus died... And by the way, what separated the holy place from the holy of holies? The veil, right? When Jesus died, the Lord did something to symbolize that from that point on, it wasn't just one person once a year. Now anybody who wants to can come into the presence of God. In Mark 15, verse 37, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, breathed his last, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he died. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom not bottom to top not side to side top to bottom it was God opening the way now that veil was itself very symbolic Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 and 20 therefore brethren having boldness 
to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. See, his broken body represents the, the torn veil. God tore that veil symbolically because Jesus' body was torn open for you and me. And so the Ark of the Covenant was behind the veil. On the other side of that veil, there were three pieces of furniture. The first was the table of showbread, or actually it's also translated the table of the bread of presence, of God's presence. Verse 23, you shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, a cubit and a half its height. So three feet long, one and a half foot wide, two feet high. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around, so that wide, about four inches or so, a raised uh, band around the top, keep the bread from sliding off. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings in the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Every week, fresh batch of 12 loaves of unleavened bread to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. How does the table of showbread tell us, speak to us of Jesus? John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. The table of showbread foreshadowed Jesus as our bread of life. Now, the next piece of furniture was the golden lampstand, the menorah. By the way, this is an actual menorah that the Temple Mount Institute have built. It is made out of gold. It does have a steel internal structure because they don't know how the Jews made a solid gold lampstand because the weight of the knobs or it's, yeah, the knobs and the blossoms and then the almond decorations at the top would have been so great it would have made the, the pipes sag. So the Jews back in Moses' day had more skill than the Jews and anybody else today has. And so this was the golden lampstand. By the way, in Rome, in the city of Rome, there is this arch called the Arch of Titus. And there... This is, uh, commemorates General Titus' victories, including the destruction of Jerusalem. That place there outlined, here it is up close. And guess what is depicted from the, uh, the Roman soldiers carrying back after the destruction of Jerusalem? The, the golden lampstand. So this really is kind of what it looked like. That was the shape of the menorah in the original temple. There are other things that they were carrying as well. One of them that is missing is the ark. Where is the ark? Where is the ark of the covenant? There is a... Uh, some Ethiopian monks believe that they have it hidden somewhere in Ethiopia. Josephus, the Jewish historian around the time of Jesus says that 500 and some odd years earlier, when the Babylonians were coming to destroy Jerusalem, Jeremiah the prophet took the ark and hid it in one of the inner chambers underneath the Temple Mount. I saw online today that there is a rumor that the Ark of the Covenant is underneath Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. But we all know because of Indiana Jones, <laughs> that it's in one of our government warehouses, right? No problem. Personally, I don't care. Oh, no, by the way, there's another rumor that because there's, there's a piece from that relief of the Arch of Titus that is broken off, some believe that it, it originally had the Ark, that Titus did carry the Ark back to Rome. 
There are some who believe that the Roman Catholic Church, in their vast treasuries and storehouses, many of their underground uh, storehouses and catacombs and all, that the ark is actually there. And they're just waiting for the time when it's right in order to bring it out because it is on the heart of Rome to unite Catholicism, Protestantism, and Islam and all of the other religions of the world under one umbrella. This is something that the popes have wanted to do for many, many years, but the timing hasn't been right in their minds. We don't know. We don't know where it is, and personally, I don't care, because all of that is just a picture. It's a snapshot. I'm thrilled that I get to be with Jesus forever and ever. That's what I'm thrilled about. So you make this lampstand a pure gold. Basically, verses 31 through 40 are this, these wonderful descriptions of an ornamental knob, flower, and an almond on top of it, and uh, uh, seven branches and all um, in total. Uh, but it was the only light in the tabernacle. How does this only light represent Jesus? John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. By the way, Jesus said, you and I, we're the light of the world as well. In Matthew 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world, Jesus said. Now we are not the source of light, but we're the reflection of his light. He is the source, we are the reflection. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So you've got the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, the table of showbread and the golden lampstand, and another piece of furniture in the first part, the holy place. And that third piece of furniture was what? Who knows? It was the altar of incense. But God doesn't get to explaining and describing the altar of incense until chapter 30. And only right after God institutes sacrifice. Because in Scripture, what does incense represent? Prayer. That's right. In Psalm 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. And the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Now let me ask you a question. If a person hasn't come to faith in Jesus Christ, they may pray, but does God hear them? No. Unless their prayer is, Jesus, come into my life, is the only prayer he'll hear from a non-believer. And Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, it cannot say, nor is ear heavy, cannot hear. Your iniquities have separated you from your God, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. And so God doesn't even get to the altar of incense where it represents our prayers until after the sacrifice has been dealt with. Because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we now have access into God's presence that he invites us to come in and pray. And he'll hear us. And he'll answer our prayers. So it's fitting that God waits to deal with the altar of incense until after he deals with the issue of sacrifice. But since Jesus died and rose from the dead, we can come to him in prayer any time we want. Any time, even right now. Father, thank you for your word tonight and for giving us a little glimpse of heaven. Lord, we don't know exactly how this snapshot is going to somehow be translated into a heavenly living reality, but we know that it will. And we're going to be so blessed to be able to see the living reality and, and know, Lord, that we've studied these things. And, and, Lord, it's all going to be about you. Lord, all of this relates to you, and we're, we're amazed. Lord, particularly the mercy seat, the place where we have received mercy from you. And the blood of the Lamb that was slain and then brought in once a year, Lord, that speaks of you as well, for you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord. Our sins are taken away. Oh, God, we love you. We are so unworthy, undeserving, but are so blessed because of you. 
Can't wait for heaven. Until then, Lord, help us to invest in your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to reach out to people and invite them to come and hear your word and to tell them how much you love them and what you've done for them. They would just believe. They will not perish but have everlasting life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.